we have very quickly moved our way to Genesis 4. Why are y'all laughing? Huh? Yeah. Genesis chapter 4, turn there. Unless you want me to spend more time in Genesis chapter 3, there's a few things I could probably preach on. Genesis chapter 4. Uh, let's read uh, verses 1 through 5. Um, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. It's good to have you with us this afternoon. Good to have you folks with us online. And uh, Michael, this week we're going to have to change that computer out. Are you up for it? Oh, all right. All right, good deal. Figures we bought a new one to replace that one that's given us sound problems. Might as well change it out and use it. So I've got a computer that I, I've been trying to do some rendering of the videos at home and it keeps crashing on me, so I'll just take that one and recycle it. Genesis 4, um, now the world begins. The world that we live in now, uh, is this is when it really begins. The problems, uh, I guess you could call this the, the problem that sin brings to families. All right? So God has driven man out of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve have left. And so this is no longer the Garden of Eden that we live in. This is the world as it is, the world full of sin and the problems that sin brings. The sins, uh, you know, at some point we got to grow up and we, and we bring families into this world and it doesn't take long before we see that the sins of the father are really carried down to the third and fourth generation. And that's what we're going to see here. Genesis 4 verse 1, Adam knew his wife, knew Eve his wife. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And I want you to pay attention to that because I'm going to address something here in a little bit. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, means he is angry, he's full of wrath, and his countenance fell. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, uh, we'll need wisdom as we go through these verses tonight. I pray, dear God, that you would bless your word, uh, that you would open up our eyes and help us to see uh, some things maybe we never saw before. Help us, dear Father, to understand that we'll need the whole of the Bible to understand a part of the Bible. So, Father, we pray, God, that you would help us to do that tonight. We believe your word and we trust your word. And so, Father, Lord, open up our hearts and help us to receive it, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. So, uh, the Jewish people, because they only have the Old Testament, uh, some of the Jewish rabbis, the Jewish sages, whatever, would probably not understand this story of Abel and Cain and why God accepted Abel's sacrifice, why he did not accept Cain's sacrifice, because I think the real answer to that is found in the New Testament. It's not revealed until you get to the New Testament. I'll show you why I think that in a little bit. Um, and then, and let's see here. Yeah, yeah, we're going to understand that here shortly. But let's go back to verse 1. Adam knew, knew Eve his wife, and she conceived. Uh, even though Adam and Eve came together in the Garden of Eden, uh, where they had access to the Tree of Life, Eve did not bring forth a child, nor did, they con did she conceive while they were in the Garden of Eden. It wasn't until after God put them out that I think God allowed her to conceive. And that is, she is going to, the mistake that she made, the sin that she committed, all of these things that God said in Genesis chapter 3 concerning 
womanhood, concerning that her, her desire is to be to her husband, uh, concerning the fact that she's going to bring forth children in sorrow and so on. All of these things are, are, are going to be brought to pass after they are expelled in the Garden of Eden. So Adam knew his Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Now, let me stop and address something here. There's probably quite a few people online that you'll probably see this from if you look for it. I've been hearing about it for years. That there are people in this world that God righteously, indignantly hates because they are of the seed of Cain. Okay? And uh, that somehow Cain's seed survived the flood and God still hates them. Um, if you study racism, and I, and I have, unfortunately, because um, a pastor's wife asked me to look into some things several years ago. And um, she, this pastor's wife, was, and she is still firm in her belief, that she is a real Jew because she's a white European descent, okay? And so she asked, she had, she, somebody gave her a copy of this book. It was written late 1800s. And uh, she gave me a copy of it and asked me to look at it. Asked me to look at it and into it. So I did. And um, come to find out, the area that she's from is pretty much the American headquarters for every racist movement in the country, just about. Okay? Um, and I'll just say Northwest Arkansas. Okay? The Ku Klux Klan, located down there, skinheads. Um, Timothy McVeigh um, and some of the people he, hang, he ran with back before he blew up um, the building in Oklahoma City. McVeigh was associated with some types that had compounds. Eastern Oklahoma, Northwestern Arkansas, okay? So you can imagine certain types of people, they anti-government, very distrustful, so on, all right? But it's the idea that if you are white and of European descent, you are the real Jew and everybody else, God hates them. Everybody else is of the seed of Satan, all right, I'll say it that way, and God hates them, and God only loves, and when, when I started looking into this doctrine for this pastor's wife, I, I, my jaw dropped, I'm just going, I don't believe what I'm reading, because a lot of these called movements and churches don't mind you knowing that they hate your guts, if you're not white European descent. And uh, so they very brazenly put their doctrinal statements online and they basically said, if you're not white European descent, God hates you, you're automatically going to hell. And so I, I called her and I said, before I tell you what I found, let me ask you some questions. She said, okay. I said, um, do you believe that people from other races can be saved. And she said, well, of course I do. I said, okay. I said, um, uh, you know, just as a follow-up, you, you, I'm sure you, you believe that, you know, black people and other types of people can all go to heaven. She, of course I do. I said, okay. I said, because if there's a hundred people that believe what you're telling me, you're about the only one who actually believes other people can go to heaven because every other of them believe that everybody's going to hell except white Europeans. And um, so I said, you know, I've looked into this. I can't remember what book it, she gave me, but she still believes it. She still believes that she is a true Israeli because she is of European descent. And it goes into this 
idea that when they carried the ten northern tribes away in the Old Testament, they went into Assyria, then they went up through the, here's the word, Caucasus, Caucasus Mountains. So the word Caucasian comes from. They went up through the Caucasus Mountains and settled Western Europe, England, Scotland, and Ireland, and especially if you're of English, Anglo, Scottish, Scottish, Irish descent, then you're pretty much a, a true Jew, and everybody else is dog meat according to God. And they trace a lot of their doctrine, a lot of um, skinhead, a lot of KKK, a lot of uh, racist doctrine stems from Genesis 4 to say that there's two bloodlines on the earth. There is the true God loves you bloodline, if you're, but only if you're white. And if you're brown or if you're these fake Jews from Israel, God hates you. You're of the seed of Cain and you're of Satan's seed and God hates you and you're automatically going to hell. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Well, they, they believe, they believe based on 1 John 3, and we'll go there. In fact, go ahead and turn to 1 John 3. And I'll read the verse, and I'll explain what they believe. Okay? Which doesn't even work, because everybody was killed in the flood. So, my purpose is to believe that one of Noah's sons' wife, who yeah. was the seed of Cain, yeah. and that's where the came Okay. What, yeah, I know you've, you've, I've read the same thing. What verse is that? It's not. Okay, it's not there. So, but that's what they do with, the, people make, people make God into whatever they want him to be. First John three eleven. it's given us the typology of Cain and Abel. The New Testament is explaining to us in fact, that's why I said what I said a while ago. You will only get why God accepted Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's from the New Testament. It's the only place in the world you'll get it from. 1 John 3, 11, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain. Cain simply didn't love his brother. Had he loved Abel, he would never... You don't kill somebody you love. You kill people you hate, okay? And so, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. Now, look back in Genesis 4. I right, put it up on the screen. Verse 1. Where did Eve say she got her son from? The Lord. But these racists want to put, they say, now the Hebrew, this is where you can play tricks with language that you don't know, okay? These are non-Jews, non-Hebrews, people who don't speak Hebrew as a language or even know the words, go to a strong concordance or some other thing to redefine these Hebrew words, to, to make it say like, I should have gotten a man from the Lord or I didn't get a man from the Lord. Anything but, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And it expressly says, Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain. So they have to use one of those chisels we was watching in my office a while ago. We're watching a guy restore antique woodwork. He has this amazing chisel. But anyway, so you have to use one of these chisels to really spread apart these words and jam Satan in there. But it's not there. They want you to believe that Satan slept with Eve and conceived in her Cain. But that is not what Genesis 4 says. It's not what it says. Adam knew his wife. She conceived a bare Cain. Boom. God is not leaving you any other idea here. Okay, he's not, he did not leave any room in here for you to think anything else other than that. And she said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. So we go back to 1 John 3, 11. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, 
and slew his brother. What does that mean then? That he was of that wicked one. Um, well, we know, we know Satan spoke to Eve. We know then that Eve's bloodlines corrupt. Um, and, and all of us are sinners. Okay? So technically, all of us are children of Belial. In the sense that we are children and we have all, we have, sin has been passed down to all of us and all of us are capable of hating people enough to kill them. Okay? So not as Cain who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. Wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So there's where you're getting the, uh, the real understanding of what's going on in Genesis 4 is the New Testament is filling in for you the doctrine of why God accepted Abel's sacrifice and rejected Cain's. Because the New Testament's telling you Cain was just pure evil. Okay, you got two brothers here. And one of them's bad and one of them's good. And by the way, you have that pattern repeated different places in the Bible. Jacob and Esau. One of them's good, one of them's rotten. Okay? So in, in other places. But anyway, Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, brethren, if the world hates you. Now you, he brings the whole world in. The whole world, in its first birth, is the same as Cain. First birth. The first birth people will always hate the people who have been born again. Always. They have, and that's the meaning of it. They have since the beginning. Okay, they have since the beginning. So, going back to Genesis 4. And by, by the way, I haven't explained this much. But the, the chapter 4, the meaning of the number 4, represents the gospel... Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four Gospels. Spiritual realm is what it represents. And that's what you see in Genesis 4. You see, um, you know, where God said, I will, um, what's the verse I'm thinking of? My blood sugar must be getting low. Can't think. We can't pass down sin to the third and fourth generation. So, that's what you see here. God is, the transgressions of Adam and Eve are carried out. Eve brings forth, her, her very first son ends up being a killer. I mean, imagine that. The first child, <laughs> sorry, Lindsay. <laughs> the first child you have ends up being a killer. It stinks to be J.R., okay? <laughs> or Michaela or whatever, all right? Oh, are you going to get me some candy? All right, I appreciate it. Uh, almond joy, because sometimes, yeah. Anyway, yeah, they're in there. I checked a while ago. I should have had one while ago. Anyway, um, I've, I've got, so anyway, that's the meaning of the number four. So the very first family here that shows up on the earth, one brother's killing another. That's not almond joy. Help him out, Christina. He got what he wanted, I think. So anyway, all right, back to the scriptures. That way my mind will stay straight. Adam knew his wife Eve. She conceived bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. She again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of ground. Now, something else I think that might throw a little weight into this is that if we look back in Genesis chapter 3, thank you. She knows what an almond joy is. Back in Genesis chapter 3, when it, when it comes to what God cursed, what did God specifically curse back in Genesis chapter 3? While I'm chewing this. The ground. God specifically cursed the ground. Where is Cain's sacrifice coming from? It's going to take a minute. 
Abel was the keeper of sheep. Christ is the lamb. Cain a tiller of the ground. We know the ground is cursed with... You've got to be careful not to spit the coconut on the Bible. While I'm getting this down me, um, Wednesday night I was talking about Catholic doctrine and Catholic superstition. And I learned something yesterday. This is going to make some of you mad, but... Um, part of the superstition of the Catholic doctrine. Catholic doctrine says, if I'm the Catholic priest, and I say the magic words over this almond joy, I can turn this almond joy into the literal body of Christ. And I can turn the spit in my mouth into the literal blood of of Jesus Christ. So you are literally eating his flesh and literally drinking his blood. And they're pretty serious about it. The Catholic funeral I went to, I noticed that the priest had a had a piece of like look like cardstock that he was very he set it on top of the chalice and he broke the wafer over that cardstock. And when he got done, he took that cardstock and made sure that all the crumbs landed in And so there is a room for the priest to go into when he's done doing the Mass. And it's called a sacristy. Sacra meaning sacred. It's a sacred room. So the priest goes in there. It's a place where he takes off his official vestments just in case a piece of that wafer ends up on any of the vestments They're washed in that room and that the water from that room drains directly into the ground, into the earth and not into the sewer because you can't have the body of Christ floating around in a sewer. That would be sacrilege. That is, I'm telling you the truth. That is their belief. Okay, you cannot have a piece of the divine body of Jesus floating around out there somewhere. So the priest has to take his vestments off in this special room. And I'm not going to say a whole lot, but the reason I found is that this showed up on YouTube. A judge was sentencing this Australian archbishop, a cardinal, because he had performed a mass, went into the sacristy. Two of the choir boys had snuck in there to drink some of the wine because that's where they kept it. And he shut the door behind him and said, you boys are in a lot of trouble. And I won't tell you what he did to him after that, but you figure it out. And then that man moved up in the Catholic hierarchy, like nobody's business, ends up holding a job at Rome. So they had to bring him back, throw him in prison. And they threw him in prison. Okay? But that's how I learned about that room, was that's, yeah, it's wicked. Amen? Like Cain. So Abel also, verse 4, he also, now I want you to think of the typology. Cain is a type, he is of that wicked one, so he's a, who is a type of? Satan. Abel is righteous, so who is he a picture of? Okay? The, the guilty killing the innocent. Okay? All of, it tells you that Abel's deeds were righteous. Cain's deeds were wicked. And then it shows you that that war that exists constantly between the world and us. And if the world ain't against you, you're on the wrong side of the world. Okay? So Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. The first, I mean, every, Abel's doing everything right. It's was his decision, I guess, Cain's, to bring of what he brought forth of the ground. Abel's decision to bring what he brought forth out of his flocks. But he's bringing the firstlings of the flock. Not, he's bringing the best ones. Not the diminished skinny ones. Not the, not the, uh, the runts of the litter. He's bringing in the best of the flocks that he has. And Abel, uh, firstlings of the flock, and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. 
So we read 1 John 3. So look at verse 5 in Genesis uh, chapter 4. Uh, well, we already... Okay, let's read verse 6 then. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. So think, think of the name somebody else that's waiting at the door. Christ. Okay. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open to me, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. And that's one of the things between Christ and Satan. Christ will always come right at you through the door of your eyes, through the door of your ears. He will never barge in. He will never just take over. He takes you give Christ control of your life. He's asking, can I come in? If you don't let him, he's not coming in. Amen? He's not coming in. But the devil is a thief. He tries to always come in some other way. He's very subversive, very sneaky about what he does. But sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule him. In other words, Cain, if you'll do right, you won't have anything to be... Worried about. You won't have anything to be jealous over. You won't have anything uh, to worry about. Abel, he'll look up to you. You're the older brother. He will follow you. Thou shalt rule over him. But that's not how it turned out. So now in verse 8, Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him so back to first john chapter three turn there and there's a lot of first john that is all about well the whole book of first john who can tell me what it's about does anybody know offhand first john one primary subject. Huh? First John. It's in there. Primary subject, First John. These things have been written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Used to be when someone would get saved, we'd tell them to read John's gospel and First John. First things to read out of the Bible. Because they would always ask, what, do you, what should I read out of the Bible? John's gospel and first John because first John gives us that assurance of salvation the day you get saved you're on cloud nine but the second day you're saved you're on less than cloud nine because guess who found out you not you that you're saved the devil and he came to try to steal to very quickly try to steal that away and so we tell people read first John because you're gonna need that assurance to know that and one of the verses that we give to people when we lead them to Christ is first John 1 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and I ask people do you believe that yes I believe that then you are saved. God doesn't lie you are saved so uh, you love is a, is a big part of it because in first John you'll find this theme of if you hate your brother you're not saved you're like Cain Okay, Cain, who got a mark on him. Think about the connection now. He was of that wicked one and he got marked. All right. So first John 311 again, for this is the message ye have from the beginning. And he's referencing Genesis chapter four, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother and wherefore slew he him. Because his own works are evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Uh, we're going to get into this, but uh, turn to Galatians 4. I say we're going to get into this. We're going to do that in Sunday school. In Galatians 4, 
Uh, we have two brothers, Isaac and Ishmael. Who was the firstborn? Ishmael. And Ishmael and Hagar hated Sarah and Isaac. Hated them. Okay? And mocked them. And Sarah said, uh, this is my servant. You think I'm going to put up with that? I want him out. And, they, and it grieved Abraham. He went to God and God said, put him out. Trust me, Abraham. I know what I'm doing. Roundabout way. But in Galatians 4, we have... Um, in verse 28, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Verse 29, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. So two examples so far out of your Bible of brothers. And Esau, when he found out that Jacob had just been in to see daddy and took his birthright, took his blessing, said, if I see him again, I'll kill him. I'll kill him if it's the last thing I do. If I see him again, I will kill him. So just like Cain and Abel, just like Ishmael and Isaac, and it, it, it literally got so bad that Abraham sent Ishmael and his mother out with a bottle of water and a loaf of bread and said, go. God found him and blessed him, of course, just like he did Esau. There's something there I won't get into tonight. Uh, but anyway, it's the idea that now I'll say it again, if the world doesn't hate you, you are on the wrong side of the world. Keep that in mind, okay? All the churches are wanting lost people to love them. They're wanting the favor of all these lost people. Rick Warren goes, finds the richest county in America. Okay, and says, I'm going to build me a church there. Goes knock on all these wealthy people's doors, asking them, what would it take for me, for me to get you in my church? And he makes a list and does practically everything they tell him. They say, we don't want to sing these old hymns. Gone. We don't want to feel convicted. Done. We don't want you telling us that our lifestyle is wrong. Never hear it from me. So he waters down, he changes, he does whatever these lost people tell him to do. And lo and behold, he's got campuses all over. Southern California, Southern Los Angeles, he's got them everywhere. And all of a sudden he's writing books and he is Mr. It. He's got other people like dumb Mike Hoggard was going to follow this guy at one point. And dumb down the messages and get everybody to like me and that then it'll be great. Then we'll have us a really big church here. And it's just not that way. But that seems to be the way of the church now. Let's get let's let our lovers be all of these lost people. Let's get them to come in here. We will make them feel good. We will tell them what they want to hear and they will leave lots of money in our offering plates and it works. It works. So, if you're being loved by the world or, and I may do this when I get back from P. Ridge, love not the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Okay? So, Acts chapter 5, verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom, uh, that's, I'm missing something here. Back to 1 John 3. I wasn't done there. Uh, verse 13. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life. Because we love the brethren. Who are the brethren? Your church. We know that we pass from death unto life because we love the church. We love church people. We love coming to church. Um, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. That's New Testament sins. The law said thou shalt not kill. So all these Jews said I've never killed. But they hate everybody. 
because they're not Jews. Of course, the world hates the Jews. Everybody hates the Jews. But they hate everybody. Okay? So they think they can hate everybody and God still like that they're not breaking God's commandments. But then Jesus comes along in Matthew, first book of the New Testament, and dashes that all to pieces. He said, you've heard, thou shalt not commit adultery. Yeah, bless God, or never committed adultery. Jesus said, well, I say unto you, he's, he's given out new new list here. I say unto you, if a man look upon a woman to lust after, he's committed adultery with her in his heart already. Jesus just told all those Jewish men, you're all adulterers. And that didn't sit well with them. But it's true. Sins don't just, uh-oh, got a problem here. Sins don't just start in the outer workings of the flesh. They, it's okay. Sins don't just show up in the outer workings of the flesh. They start in the heart. Jesus made that clear. Out of the heart goeth these issues of life. Out of the heart cometh murders, debates, deceit, adulteries. The things that we do... They come from what's already in the heart. And they, because they challenge Jesus. Ah, oh, your disciples eating with unwashing hands. Jesus said, you're not defiled by what goes in the body. You're defiled by what comes out of the body. Let me tell you what comes out. Everything that's in your wicked heart already, eventually it will come out of you. Somebody say amen. And whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer and knoweth that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So we have these New Testament sort of variations of Old Testament commandments. While I'm, I have never taken the life of any human being, ever. If I ever hated somebody bad enough I wanted, didn't want to see them alive ever again. Yep. Okay. I'm not going to deny it. Neither should you. Okay. But we've done it. Okay? And it's a sin. Those things have to be confessed and uh, try, to, try to get enough Bible in you to get that out of your heart. Get that hatred out of your heart for people. Especially, especially some in your own family. Um, I can't remember why I put these two verses in my notes. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Oh, okay. It's because the Jews were murderers. That's what it was. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you slew and hanged on a tree. So the Jews right with God? No, they killed Christ. If you remember when Mel Gibson made his movie, The Passion of the Christ, he was, it was called anti-Semitic. He, he, it was called anti-Jewish because it depicted the Jews making the decision to kill Christ. They did. That's a historic gospel fact. They were offered a way out by Pilate who did not want to kill Jesus. They were offered a way out. They refused it. They said no killing. So they're guilty of it. Uh, and the early disciples told those Jewish leaders exactly who they were. You slew your Messiah on a tree. You, hate, you say you're the people of God, and yet you killed the one that God sent. Acts 10, 39, we are witnesses of all these things, which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Uh, turn to Matthew 23. I'm starting to get my head back. Matthew 23. Look at verse... 13, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For neither, need, for neither ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses 
and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. That was one of the verses that William Tind or John Wycliffe wanted the people of England to know. Because the Catholic priests are going by stealing all these widow houses. And they wanted them to know, the people to know that. Um, verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever uh, shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever swear by the gift that is upon the altar, he is guilty. And he's talking to these Jews who added all these rules on top of the commandments of God. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, look at verse, verse 27. Thou blind, or yeah, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and full of uncleanness. Um, verse 28, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. That's your Roman Catholic, that's modern 21st century religion, in other words. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, verse 29, Hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? In other words, he's, they, they decorate the tombs of the prophets and say had we been in our father's day we wouldn't have killed them and jesus said you're their children yeah well, yeah you would have they not only killed jesus but they killed every prophet that came to them to warn them about the ways of god they killed them they slew them they put them they put jeremiah in prison ezekiel was given the book of god to preach and he said i'm not sending you to people far away of a strange language to preach i'm pre sending you to preach to your own people and he, and he said, whether they will repent, who knows? But I'm going to send you to preach to them anyway. And most of them did not repent. In fact, when they came to Ezekiel the prophet and it said, inquire of God for us, God told Ezekiel back, this is Ezekiel 14, why should I be inquired at all of them? They have idols in their hearts. They're full of treachery. They're full of wickedness. Why should I be inquired of them? Why should I speak to them? And I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll speak to them on the measure of the abundance of the uh, idols that they have in their heart. That's how God said he would speak to them. God said, basically, I'll let them believe lies is what I'll do. So back to Genesis chapter 4, verse 9. Cain has killed Abel. They slew Jesus Christ the righteous. But I won't say, I won't say it was the Jews alone. We are the ones. There's, there's a lot of things about Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, that I do not like. And some things that it was based on that's not scriptural. One of the things I do like what he did, and I know Mel Gibson is far away from the gospel. But when they came to film the scene of them driving the nails in Christ's hands, there's a close-up shot in his hands to be in the actor. And he said this, he said, those are my hands, because I'm the one who did that. At least he knows that. Christ died simply because we're sinners. We are born of sinners. We come from a long line of sinners going all the way back to brothers who were both sinners. And Adam and Eve who were both sinners. The Lord said unto Cain in verse 9 of Genesis chapter 4, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? God knows what Cain has done. 
But just as God, there's a lot of similarities here to what God did with Cain's father. Adam, where art thou? God knew where Adam was. Okay, he googled it. <laughs> no, he knew where Adam was. Okay, he's not inquiring because he doesn't have the information. He's doing what a father would do with his son when he knows the son's done something wrong. He's confronting him. He's confronting him with it. Have you ever had God confront you about something? It's not pleasant. God will ask you, where'd you go? What'd you do? Who are you with? Okay, God will ask you questions like that and confront you with your own transgression. This is what he's doing with Cain. Where is Abel, thy brother? He knows where he is. How does he know? Well, he saw it, number one. He knew about it, number two. Number three, Abel's blood is crying up from the ground. Cain said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So he's confronting Cain with his sin. And now art thou... So he, God's not even waiting for the answer here. And... Notice, he is not offering repentance to Cain. He is not saying to Cain, are you sorry for what you did? Do you feel bad? He's not giving him the opportunity to repent. He is going to lay it out to him. And now art thou cursed from the earth. Boom. Cursed is always Going to hell. Blessed, always going to heaven. Thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. If you go look at the Gospels and follow the timing. And Christ is on the cross and he says the words, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And about that time, it wasn't the spear that killed him. He was already dead. But when they thrust that spear into his side and the blood and water issued forth, he went into the ground. And at about that time then, there was a great earthquake and the earth opened her mouth. Just like here. Now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Okay? Now I'm going to throw something else in here. I know it's five o'clock, but I wasn't around for the first few parts of my sermon, so bear with me. Uh, turn to uh, Revelation 17. Yeah, Revelation 7. See, the earth, I think the earth and Babylon are connected. I think they are. She, the earth, is always, always, the earth is always rendered as a female, a she. The earth opens her mouth. Um, when Korah spoke against Moses, the earth opened her mouth. Where did what happened to Korah? They swallowed him up. What is that a picture of? Where did they all go? They went down, they went to hell. Okay, the earth opened her mouth and consumed them all. So we know at the heart of the earth is the fires of hell. So I think there's a connection between the earth. They call the goddess of the earth Gaia. Well, Gaia and Diana and Ashtaroth and every other feminine goddess throughout history is basically just a picture of mystery Babylon the Great. So in Revelation 17, um, you have in verse 2, she's the great whore that is, uh, sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Uh, so he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And if you look down in verse 6, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of, of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. 
And if you look back in now at Genesis 4, the earth opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. The earth drank Abel's blood. Just like Babylon the Great drinks the blood of all the martyrs and the saints who have been murdered throughout the years by this world and by the institutions of this world, including the Vatican. And I won't leave the Vatican out. They were terrorists long before the Muslims figured out how to get away with it. They were killing saints, spilling their blood by the gallon throughout several hundred years of the time they called the Dark Ages. They had the dominant rule in Europe. And if you dared whisper against the Pope, you were treated with cruelty by the Vatican, by Dominican monks. Okay, and the office of the Inquisition and the office of the Inquisition would inquire about how you spoke out against the Vatican, torture you if they have to, to get a confession out of you. And you have Fox's Book of Martyrs that details the martyrdom, starting with Stephen and going all through the Dark Ages, all throughout early European history where the, the popes demanded the blood of those who would not submit to the papal authority in Rome. Thousands and thousands were murdered and slaughtered, burned, literally burned at the stake. Just for one thing. We believe in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Amen. And so Abel, you could say, I guess, the first martyr. What was he killed for? His righteous deeds and jealousy over those deeds. And the world, see the Bible's telling you, Cain is the world. And Cain always hates Abel. And Cain's deeds are always rejected. Abel's are always accepted with God. And the Bible's giving you, telling you that difference the world is always going to hate us always now you don't have to give them reasons to okay they're going to hate you no matter what and as the evil increases in this country as i'll say it like this as marijuana sales rise they will hate us more and more as fornication and adultery and sodomy rises in this country, they will hate us more and more for speaking out against it. And at what point will we be killed? It's an interesting question. It won't go away. But it will happen. Um, very quickly... Here's the curse that God gave to him, and then we'll close. Back in verse 11, Now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth, to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto her, unto thee her strength. Very similar to what Adam was told. Very similar. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. So we get this idea that, you know, Adam tilled the ground, but must have had some success. I mean, he lived 930 years. So he teaches that to Cain. Cain's a tiller of the ground. But after he kills his brother, God tells him, it's not going to yield or strength to you anymore. You're done. So you can sort of get this idea. He tills, he tills the ground, sure enough, finds out God's right. It's not yielding anything. Maybe I move to a different place. Maybe that'll work there. And he goes to another place and he tills it up. Same thing. Goes to another place. Works the ground. He gets nothing. He gets no help from God whatsoever the rest of his life. And later, you study, continue to study Genesis 4. Later, you find out that the sins of the Father are truly handed down. Okay? And we'll see that presented in Lamech. All right? But 
just the bottom line is nobody survived the flood. Nobody from Cain still is alive today. They're all dead. Every one of them. God had rejected that whole bloodline. They were cursed. All right, let's stand to our feet.